Hello, welcome to the IPFS weekly call for uh, the 23rd of September 2019. I am Aching Brain, I will be your host. Uh, today we're gonna uh, do the usual stuff so we have any community announcements uh, that, that are in the agenda which I just pasted in the chat so probably none because I just put it in the chat uh, and then Pete Van Hardenberg from Ink and Switch is going to tell us all about the cool stuff uh, that that they're building um, in the fields of art, science, thinking, uh, and yeah, using lots of future tech, uh, distributed web technology. Uh, cool, so can I get a note taker, please? Thanks, Ollie. Um, does anybody have any uh, announcements? Go, Molly. Um, t lightning speed typing is as I could, but I ran out of time. Um, for anyone who's going to be in Japan for uh, DEF CON, that's on October 7th. We're having a, an IPFS community meetup um, hosted by the Japan Proto School chapter um, in Osaka. And on the 12th, which is a Saturday, we are going to have uh, a meetup in Tokyo for anyone who's there. And so actually, whether or not you're in town, if, you're in, if you are in Japan, um, please, please come in uh, and join your friendly local IPFS humans for um, some fun talks and workshops and delicious snacks, sushi and matcha and other tasty things. So if you're around, please come hang out. Cool. Uh, no other announcements? Great. Pete, take it away. All right. Well, thanks very much for having me here. Just get my slides up on screen. So, okay. Start with no. Okay. How's that look? Everybody can see my uh, Ink and Switch logo? Sure can. Great. <clears throat> Pardon me. <clears throat> so yeah, thanks for inviting me. My name is Peter Van Hardenberg. I'm a, a principal investigator with Ink and Switch uh, Research Labs. We're an industrial research lab motivated uh, by the idea that uh, computers and computing are failing uh, thinkers and creators. Uh, and that we have moved to a consumptive mode of computing. Uh, I'm not gonna say too much about that because this is perhaps a little farther afield from the interest of most of the people on the IPFS call. But uh, put briefly, uh, it's telling that the MacBook Pro no longer has an escape key, which is of course vital to you know, a great many professional software developers who use VI. Uh, the iPad, which originally kind of had this promise of being this incredible creative environment. For me and for most people, I think you'll find the iPad is, is most frequently used as a Netflix device. And we see, of course, that you know, all of our computing platforms, including the computing platform we spend most of our time with, uh, the phone, are sort of organized around an attentional metaphor that, that the value of uh, software that software authors can create is tied to how much of your time they can get you to spend looking at that device. And so we have these kind of perverse incentives in our technology stack that cause us to spend our time uh, being distracted and being consumptive instead of being concentrated and focused and creative. And so throughout all of the different sort of tracks of research at the lab, we've been exploring these problems from a sort of technical but also philosophical perspective and trying to understand what we can do to, to change that. So I'm going to talk a little bit about one of those tracks that uh, is we, we call local first software. Uh, you may have heard of offline first software. Uh, the idea behind offline first software is that your software should work offline first. Uh, and we kind of we think that's very, very reasonable, but we kind of extended it a little bit further uh, and added a few more requirements and begin by kind of asking the question, you know, who owns your data? Uh, now, it's, it's very popular today to pick on uh, big cloud vendors like Google for owning your data, right? If they can, you know, shut down a service and take it away, was it really yours? But it, it's more than more than just um, you know, sort of privacy or sort of corporate surveillance paranoia, which I think are perfectly reasonable. But 
you know, if you own your data, do you have it on your device? Do you worry about, you know, the startup who makes the software going out of business? If it's your data, can you choose what programs it works with? Do you decide how it gets shared, if it's shared with advertisers and so on? These are all different kind of pressures on it. And, you know, the, the number one thing that kind of motivated me to worry about this was I got really tired of all the incredible journeys that my data was going on without me. Um, you know, we, we keep having these sort of blog posts about what an incredible journey it's been to build some startup or some product, but now that journey has come to an end and with it, so has my use of the software. And meanwhile, George Martin, uh, who writes the Game of Thrones novels, continues to peck out the latest Game of Thrones novel on an ancient IBM PC running WordStar 4.0 under MS-DOS. Yeah. That, that ownership, that deep longevity is not something that's available to us today. So I'm going to outline seven kind of principles of local first software, and then I'll talk a little bit about how, how we build local first software at the lab. Um, so first, and I think it's important that we put this first, uh, is the software fast. Um, our research and, and sorry, I shouldn't say our research. We have found and by surveying the existing research that people grossly and radically undervalue performance in software and that, you know, running at 60 frames a second, loading in 100 milliseconds, these kinds of things make huge, huge differences to the lived experience of consuming software. Uh, and, you know, fundamentally, we believe that local first software has the ability to be faster than any other kind of software, because if the data is already there on your computer, you don't have to wait for it to go to Ashburn, Virginia, you know, to fetch packets over the network before you can start showing results. You know, uh, you know, next frame or your money back has been sort of a rallying cry for us, but uh, it's quite difficult to achieve today. Another question, you know, about local first software is, you know, can you actually use this software on all your devices? Is this software trapped inside, you know, a single computer? Is your data trapped in a computer? Is it stuck on your phone? Is it, you know, obviously uh, for software to be useful, your data has to be available where you are. And that means being available on all your devices. Uh, of course, it's not your data if you can't get to it when you're in an airplane or in a train or in my house, just standing kind of near the refrigerator. Super frustrating. Um, we believe that uh, humans are a collaborative species and that software which doesn't support collaboration where appropriate is just kind of broken out of the box. Uh, we talked a little bit about the incredible journey problem. You know, will this software have longevity? Will it live a long time? Are you kind of, you know, can you trust this software to do your most important creative work of your life? You know, if you begin writing a novel, would you use this software or would you worry that before the novel was done that the company would have pivoted or gone out of business or, you know, sunsetted that software? Uh, obviously, privacy and security are concerns everywhere, but particularly when we're talking about our creative work, it's just not comfortable to feel that um, strangers or other people might be accessing your work without your knowledge. Uh, and last, sort of talking about data control and ownership, this is a little bit of an umbrella concept, but uh, if someone else can delete the data, it's not your data. If you can't choose where it is or how it works or whether you write to it, it's not your data. You know, a concrete example here that we talk about a lot is this idea of, you know, people keep trying to invent sort of right protection uh, for decentralized systems. And I think that's sort of fundamentally misguided because if the data is on my computer and I can't write to it, then it's not my data. It's somebody else's data. You know, if, if someone else can revoke my access to the data, it's not my data. And we believe very strongly that, that the things on your computer should be yours and that it's disempowering and destructive of user agency to, to take that away. Okay, so that's, you know, a brief philosophical tour. I'll happily answer questions about it towards the end, but I wanna talk about some of our experiments in actually building local first software briefly. So first, uh, a caveat, browsers are not local first. Uh, I know that's probably not a surprise to anyone on the call, but it's really amazing just how hostile browsers are to the idea of not having a network connection. And that's despite really good work from people like uh, Francis and Alex Russell to, uh, you know, work on PWAs and so on. You know, browsers delete your data. You know, it's your data. I tried to open up something that I had, a PWA I hadn't used in a few months, and it just wasn't there anymore. I, I relied on that. I trusted it and I went to load it and it was gone because I don't know why. Uh, browsers just don't, don't keep data locally. They're not built that way. 
Uh, as of course everybody on this call knows, browsers don't support all the things that we need to do peer-to-peer -peer networking. Uh, and you know, fundamentally, you, you just can't use your browser in an airplane. I can't tell you the number of times I've sort of tabbed to something in my browser and then you know, I see it for like two frames and then the browser goes to refresh and pull the data and it's gone, super frustrating. Um, but maybe in a place where I would sort of cleave from the IPFS position, I also think that the daemon solution is, is not viable. Uh, asking a user to install a daemon on their computer is, you know, one, just sort of practically, I think that's, I would call that adoption poison, uh, your ability to convince people to use your software if they have to install two things and one of them is a weird thing that runs in the background is, is quite low. Uh, and I think just that conceptually, the idea of having these sort of spooky action at a distance of things running in the background behind your computer is, is kind of, I say user hostile, but what I really mean is sort of user experience hostile. It's very hard to provide a really high quality user experience. And sure, you can work on your tray app all you want, make that as nice as you like, but it's, it's fundamentally, um, now you have two things and one of them is this weird, mysterious thing that requires all this explanation. I just wanna open the software and have the software. Uh, and yes, of course, I've talked to IPFS people about this before and they say, oh, well, in the beautiful future, um, you know, every OS will have IPFS built into it. That's nice. Um, but you don't get to live in that future if uh, you can't solve problems today. And uh, I don't really see how that path converges uh, with the current course and speed. Okay, so, well, Bowser's out. What are we going to do? Yep, it's Electron. Uh, I hate Electron as much as anyone else who uses Electron on a daily basis. However, uh, I have written a lot of software in a lot of ways, and at this point, I'm just used to it. Uh, Electron is a pretty great solution for building cross-platform software, and not only that, uh, it allows you to access the wealth of skills and uh, creative innovation that's going on in the browser development space, but without tying yourself to the network. So, okay, you've suffered long enough through uh, me just sort of yammering on about philosophical principles. Let's look at some screenshots and talk about actual projects we've done. Uh, this first project I'm showing here was one of our early projects. It's called Pixel Pusher. So Pixel Pusher was an experiment in um, basically taking some of our local first principles and bringing them to life uh, by modifying an existing React app. I'll have a link to the blog posts about some of these things at the end so you can check it out in more detail. Uh, but what you see here is we took somebody's basic uh, pixel art editor uh, built with React and we bolted uh, sort of a distribution system underneath it based on a CRDT that we've been working on with Martin Kleppman called AutoMerge. And so what you see on the right here is a little map of different versions of this software. You can see this one maybe has uh, some shading on the pixels a little different. This one's kind of chunky. Yeah, it's maybe a little too small, fine details. This one has a different gray background. And what happens is that you can create forks and then merge them back up. So you can basically sort of dynamically collaborate with people. In this case, there's only a single user working on each of these. That's that sort of green rectangle. But you can imagine, and indeed when we we're working on the project, we would create all these sort of wild variations of images and then you can mix and match anything and merge anything together with anything else. And because we've built around a causally ordered uh, CRDT conflict-free replicated data type, we could detect any time two users had edited the same pixel and provide really intelligent uh, conflict resolution. A later project we worked on, here's Pushpin. This is uh, an earlier version of Pushpin I can show live. If people are interested later what it looks like today. But Pushpin is sort of cards on a canvas. There's a number of products based around these ideas. But again, the idea here was exploring um, what does collaboration look like in a more uh, user-friendly kind of way. And so while, yes, you can see the sort of cards on a canvas here, a lot of the magic is in uh, the title bar at the top where we were exploring questions about, you know, uh, what does it mean to meet another user? How do you track identity and presence? And so you can see, for example, here, uh, there's a little green ring around Adam's avatar, and that means that he's online and he's broadcasting on a pub sub channel a little sort of heartbeat. So because I know him, I can see that he's online. And if he selected some of these cards, I would see his selection state. We can look more at that later. Uh, we've done a number of other projects, including Capstone, which uh, we wrote pretty extensively about and published, which was built as a Google app. Uh, Google apps are a bit like Electron apps. Um, I'm currently calling you from a Pixel book. 
Um, the Google app was interesting to us because it allowed us to harness this kind of browser technology, JavaScript technology, uh, but it had access to real networking stack. Um, that effort was ultimately less successful than we had hoped. And I think a lot of the difficulty there came from uh, abandonment is too strong a word perhaps, but I think it would be fair to say that uh, Google is not actively investing in that stack anymore. And they're quite transparent about this. This wasn't a surprise, but also just, uh, although many of the APIs and interfaces are essentially, you know, just as with Node, they're essentially JavaScript wrappers around deep system libraries. There was enough kind of like local inflection that it made actually using existing technologies from the Node ecosystem on the Google Apps ecosystem quite uh, fraught with like subtle bugs that took sometimes long times to run down. So that was ultimately my advice is uh, don't pick Google Apps, uh, not that Google would tell you to for uh, uh, your projects. Uh, and then we also built one called Farm, which I don't have any screenshots of, sadly, but it was a really interesting experiment where we basically paired a, a CRDT document that could change over time uh, collaboratively to code for a web component written in the Elm programming language that was also itself a CRDT. And so we had this really cool kind of environment where you could remix apps and I could share a link with you and then you'd open it up and you'd download all the code and all the data to see what I saw. And then we could both both edit the software or the data by using the software together. And that's a lot of fun, but ultimately uh, quite challenging to uh, sort of rationalize for a user. So I wanna talk a little bit briefly now, having built, we've been at this almost three years, uh, building various research projects and experiments. I wanna talk about the things that I see as working and the things that I see as not working. Uh, so things that are working, really well include, you know, I think this notion of standalone software is something that I would like to see more people internalize. Um, it's amazing to work on a piece of software and that's it. Uh, <laughs> I know this sounds silly, but you know, having been a web person for a long time, you kind of have this like tripartite world where there's always a data stack, an API stack, and then a front end stack. And then you have to deploy it afterwards. And it's just so incredible and empowering to, you know, have a piece of software and to work on it and to use it. And it works and you're done. You know, if it works on your machine, that's literally it. Somebody else's machine is probably going to have the same behavior. There's no, you know, separate deploy step. There's no separate, uh, you know, platform that's different. You don't have a migration to run in prod. You know, your computer is where the software is going to live. So if it works, it works. Uh, we've been very pleasantly surprised by just how well CRDTs work in terms of ordering and collaborating on data. Uh, specifically, uh, the CRDT we work on is something called Auto Merge. There's lots of stuff written about it out there. Martin's always out talking about it. But Auto Merge is a sort of a JSON-like CRDT, which is to say it's a series of lists and maps that can nest together sort of arbitrarily with values in them. And uh, that models a lot of data use cases really well. So uh, that's surprisingly good. We were really worried about sort of conflict resolution and the uh, challenges of like making, um, you know, dealing with things arriving in different orders from different users and people creating problems. And in Pixel Pusher, we did a bunch of work around UIs for that. But really surprisingly for us, working on later projects, we discovered that for the most part, uh, while conflicts can occur, humans seem to have relatively strong innate collaboration sort of intuitions and so don't create problems for each other. Um, that was a big surprise, uh, positively. And also the sort of functional reactive programming model, the React, the Elm kind of uh, model is a really good fit for decentralized systems because you have a very clear separation between the data, the transform function, <clears throat> pardon me, <clears throat> the data, the transformation of the data to a UI, and then events coming back from that UI into the data, which maps really well onto um, an environment where your data could be updated either locally or by any remote user. So that's all good. Uh, things that suck, um, basically, nat traversal is 
a super big problem. This is no surprise to anyone here, but we'll talk more about particularly where my worry is there. Um, mobile support is quite dire, and it worries me that I don't see much recognition of how bad it is. Doing a good job of mobile support is not like getting this stuff working on React Native. Doing a good job of mobile support means understanding how mobile environments are fundamentally different. And by that, I mean radios and battery. And that means like if you're going to run this stuff on a mobile device, you need to take advantage of when the radio is on or off. You need to worry about not draining the battery by doing things in the background. There's so much subtlety and important research that needs to be done there, and I don't see it happening. Uh, and if anybody is doing it out there, I don't mean any insult by it. It's possible I don't. I haven't seen your work. Um, if this world of software is going to be successful, there needs to be a business model for people to build software against it. Uh, I do not think that, let's just call it like positive externalities of ICOs is a sustainable funding model. Um, I think that if you attract people chasing that, you will not get the best developers or the best work. Um, I think that ultimately every sort of generation of software needs to find a viable business model, and, but the trap that needs to be avoided here is what I would call kind of like the open source consumer software problem. Like open office sucks. The UI is terrible. It was never competitive with what's best in the market. And I think a lot of that is because the best designers and people from that community were always alienated by open source software and open source uh, culture. And so we never really got great UIs built in the open source world. Um, I hope that this world can someday be the best way not just to make software, but also the best way to make a living. Uh, and because you don't give up control over your creations and you don't need a giant team to get things done. So hopefully that can be the case. Also, just broadly, um, performance is a huge issue in the web stack, <laughs> like running things at 60 frames a second, which we talked about the importance of earlier, is really, really hard, uh, borderline impossible. And I've had lots of deep conversations with like Chrome team people about this stuff. And they're basically like, yeah, it's, it's hard. Uh, and in our particular case, um, I think a lot of the focus in the community early was around like anti-censorship or sharing of scientific data, these kinds of things. So there hasn't been a lot of, you can do privacy, sure, you can encrypt your blobs before you share them, but then that creates new problems. Um, just talking briefly about the NAT traversal issue. Uh, this is kind of the worst case for NAT traversal, which is that you are at a coffee shop with your collaborator. A uh, very common case in a coffee shop is that the router will be configured with sort of guest network access, which means that MDNS or all local kind of you to me traffic is blocked. Uh, so of course, then you go out and you say, okay, well, we'll do a sort of loopback NAT traverse. So we'll do a, you know, we'll connect out through the internet and back. Uh, but the router sees that traffic and goes, huh, this, is, this isn't right. Why would I want to make a loopback NAT traversal to myself? That's crazy. So it drops that. And the result is that there's just no way for you and me to connect if we're in the same room on the same Wi-Fi. Uh, if one of us jumps onto our phone connection, everything's fine. <clears throat> but unfortunately, it's not just in coffee shops that this happens. It's also in Airbnbs, it's at universities, and it's in company networks. And so I don't see anyone with a solution to this problem. I think broadly the most credible solution I've seen is, is something like stun or turn you know, kind of having proxy nodes out in the network. But that's really fragile, it kind of fails the longevity test, which is that if, you know, all of this traffic has to be routed by like a benevolent corporate benefactor that's operating a service in the hope of maintaining the reliability of the network, then uh, that only works as long as they feel like paying to do that, and that's not sustainable. So I hope somebody will work on that. Um, we've built all, all our stuff on top of DAT. DAT is a lot like IPFS. If you're not familiar with it, it's a, another peer-to-peer -peer data sharing stack. And with DAT, um, rather than having the addresses of content being the hash of the content, the address of content is a public key uh, that signs the content. And then each block in the content is signed with the hash of the previous content. So you can create a nice consistent append-only log system with sort of robust self-checking, which is quite cool. 
Uh, I know there are supposed to be ways to emulate this using IPNS and IPLD, um, but the performance of doing all of those lookups, it makes it completely impossible for the kind of real-time collaboration that we do. Um, I'd be interested in looking more at that. Uh, and my last kind of point for the IPFS project is that I think pinning is like totally the wrong frame to think about um, data through. Um, I remember at an internet archive meetup, somebody pointed out that all the data that we're exposed to except streaming video in a year can be put onto a single you know, micro SD card the size of our pinky fingernail. Um, I think we should always pin every piece of data that we touch. I think that should be the default uh, and we could consider sort of ways to relieve pressure if that was a problem, but it's kind of the wrong metaphor. And I think it's created so much churn in terms of like people doing all kinds of complicated and incorrect things to try and solve these problems, both at the user experience level, but also at the technical level to try and work around this. Uh, and last, very briefly, I think I'm well over time here, so I'll, I'll uh, speak quite shortly about this, but I think, you know, as we move up the stack into end user experiences, we're encountering a whole new universe of user experience challenges. So it's one thing to say, oh, this person is present or not, but why am I not able to connect to you? Are you seeing what I'm seeing? Um, you know, are we in sync? Are we out of sync? How can I tell? Uh, do I have a connection to you locally on our local Wi-Fi that we're in an airplane at 30,000 feet, but not beyond there? Um, if, you know, we talked earlier about write permission. If I'm writing to a thing, but no one else will care because it's sort of read only. Well, I should still be able to do what I want with the data on my computer. Maybe I want to scribble a note on your contact document that says, oh, I met this person at offline camp. Uh, but that's not really something that we have the mental framework or the user sort of experiences to communicate or talk about. So I think there's a lot of really interesting UX work further up the stack uh, that needs doing, and we've been exploring that. Um, thanks. Uh, I could talk for a long time about this stuff. I've talked probably for a little too long already, uh, but we can read a lot more. We've written a lot uh, more, and uh, we have lots more that we have done and not written about, so feel free to reach out if you have questions or would like to give feedback or uh, anything else. You can contact me at pvhinkinswitch.com or on Twitter as pvh. And if you're coming to offline camp, I'll be there this weekend. We'll see you soon. Woo! <laughs> that was great. Yeah, some people might have to drop off to go to the meetings, but um, if anyone wants to stick around and if there's time for some Q and A, yeah, I've got a little bit of time. Anyone got any questions? What's what is next for Ink and Switch? Oh, yeah, the age-old question. Um, well, we have a number of projects going on right now. Uh, at the moment, um, there's a team working on Pushpin. Um, we're interested in taking it from a research prototype to something that users can really use. We think that the next sort of step in um, the maturation of this space is actually putting something into end user hands. Uh, there's a lot of work to do, uh, but we're sort of making progress on that. Uh, synchronization status is something that we're working on this week, which is, okay, great, you know, we've shared data, we're connected, but like, can I see what you see? How do I know? If you're offline, how do I know where you were last? If I have the same program on my desktop and my laptop, you know, am I caught up? Am I ahead? Am I behind? How do, they, well, how do you think about all of this? How do you communicate all of this? And how do you do it without creating like a giant spreadsheet of vector clocks? So those are, uh, UI problems we're working on today, literally. Yeah, I think it's. I think that's kind of the really interesting stuff is kind of the UX of uh, of these distributed applications because everything seems to be like the kind of, you know, such and such like the Uber of such and such. It's like the, your thing, but distributed. And it's like yeah, cool. Um, whereas like, I think there's a lot of it. really deep and important work that you have to work forward from first principles to achieve, and just trying to port Google Docs to run like on the blockchain is like, uh, bluntly, I think it's shallow and lazy and doesn't actually lead to anywhere interesting. Yeah, well, okay. I, I would want to hear more about the IPLD queries because like I'm, I'm part of the IPLD team, but uh, we can okay. also certainly take this um, off <clears throat> line if you want, so. 
Yeah, let me, I speak very briefly to the motivation here. Um, uh, uh, our CRDTs are built out of long chains of um, individual operations by actors. So my you know, machine I'm calling you from might be one, my other laptop might be one, your laptop might be one. And each uh, node produces a chain of work uh, that then you need to sort of, you feed all that into a box, you shake it and then a document pops out. Um, this is not rocket science, uh, but because each operation refers to all the previous operations that all need to be resolved before you can render the document, it's extremely tedious and expensive to walk all the way back through like an IPFS uh, chain. Gozola, by the way, has been looking at some of this. So you may have heard some of these things from him. He's been looking at AutoMerge and, and our work for a while, so it's possible. Uh, you've already got some of these versions of it. But the extra challenge is that um, I also would like to be able to have storage nodes that I don't trust with the contents of the data. I don't want to have to upload unencrypted versions of my data in order for this sort of traversal to work, which means that there needs to be some kind of structure around this. But even more concerningly, you can learn an awful lot about a person and what they're doing, even just by watching the structure and the stream of this traffic. And so I have, I'm not sure what the answer here is in terms of how to distribute these kind of flows of data without creating these like really privacy uh, violating side channels. I think the scuttlebutt approach of building sort of like fat logs that have a lot of data in them and then sort of demuxing them in clients is interesting, but that has all kinds of performance problems. So I think there's a lot of, like we can make small improvements on the technical problem and that's good and necessary. Just the ability to query like a whole linked list in a single query would be nice. Um, but I think that there's quite a bit more work to do past that and I don't, I'm not sure what the state of the research is there. Yeah, um, let me quickly, quickly uh, say yeah, that um, we have a new thing called um, IPLD selectors, which is exactly this. So you can basically then query, yeah, chains of things or complete trees. And it's currently in mostly in the spec repository, but there's a JavaScript implementation for it in these days. No, no, sorry. Where is it? On, um, so it's on the IPLD repository. So it's GitHub slash IPLD slash specs for the specifications. Yeah, no, what's, what's the implementation? Uh, oh, sorry. It's only a Go implementation so far, I think. That's fine. Um, Can I take a look at it? Yeah, I will, I will post a link. I have to find it myself. Um, okay, thanks. And then there's also what we also currently work on is IPLD schemas. Um, this kind of is related to you can kind of define the structure of your data in a schema, but it would then be kind of independent of your blocks. So you can kind of have, for your application, you would still have the kind of like linked stuff and blocks, but what you expose might be, might squash it into a single block, for example. Mm -hmm. Then ends up with, you might be able to hide such things uh, as you were talking about that you might like leak information about the structure and so on. But it's like, yeah, just, Give you some hints, but yeah. the uh, links and yeah. yeah. Super interesting. I'm going to take a close look at it. Thanks. Yeah, cool. Okay. Pete, thanks very much for uh, oh, talking for to me. us about, yeah, it's been an absolute pleasure. It's been super interesting. Um, I'm going to stop recording in a second, but thank you very much. And uh, yeah, we'll see everyone on, on the internet uh, or next week. Uh, the weekly call. Cool. Thank you. Bye. Till then.